Hi, I'm Kaiser Sarif. Because I've written about Proto-Indo-European topics, I'm sometimes asked to recommend books on how to learn to write or even speak in Proto-Indo-European. The biggest problem with doing this is that no one's written a how to speak Proto-Indo-European book. That's because there are still lots of things that are being argued about and people are justifiably hesitant to put everything down and to say that this is what it is. However, over the years I've collected a number of books that together helped me piece together enough Proto-Indo-European to try to work with it. I'm by no means finished and I'm sure I will learn quite a lot in time to come, but I just thought I'd show you the ones that have brought me to where I am now. This first book is called Proto-Indo-European Syntax by Winfred Lehman. It's a fairly old book but there are very few books out there and very few journal articles actually on Proto-Indo-European syntax which is the way that words are put together to form sentences. So this is probably your, your best bet for it. You'll find more on syntax in some of these other books and even though this book is a little bit old it'll help fill in the holes to teach you things that you haven't been able to figure out from the other ones. This is Comparative Indo-European Linguistics, an introduction by Robert Beeks. Uh, it's a very good book for what's called morphology, which is the way words are formed, uh, particularly the way words are, are changed to fit in a sentence. Uh, those of you who have learned Latin know about the different cases or the, how different tenses and numbers are uh, constructed. People who learn French will know about how verbs end differently depending on whether they have to do with a, one person doing it or two people or, or whatever. Proto-European does that as well. This book is very good for showing you those endings. It's also good for phonology, which is the systems of sounds that the language makes. And there's a fair amount of lexicon in there, lexicon being the vocabulary, the collection of words in it. All in all, a very important book if you're going to try to make sentences in Proto-Indo-European. This book, Indo-European Linguistics by Michael Mayapruga, is a um, very recent book. It's actually edited by him. There are other people involved in the book. It's not a collection of articles like most edited books are. It's a collection of, well, I would say that it would it was edited from small sections written by different people. Uh, as a result of that, it's sometimes difficult to read, particularly to find things from the index. However, it's, it's definitely worth it. It's got a good amount of syntax in it. It's uh, got a fair amount of morphology and phonology. Not as good on lexicon, but still there's a fair amount in there. But it is the most recent book on the, on the topic for covering everything, so I, I highly recommend it. This is the Oxford Introduction to Proto-Indo-European and the Proto-Indo-European World by J.P. Mallory and D.Q. Adams. This is the book you want for the lexicon. It's arranged by topic with chapters on particular subjects and then all the words that are relevant to it. There's a chapter on religion, for instance, and one on activities. We have mind, emotions, and sense perception, and so on. It lists the, well, as far as I can tell, all the words that have been able to be reconstructed for Proto-Indo-European, and then also lists some that have been reconstructed for different sections of Proto-Indo-European, like, for instance, Western Indo-European, ones that are only found in the Western section of the Indo-European world. So it's an excellent place to find words for your sentences. There are also a few articles in there about more cultural aspects. This book has a scary title, Lexicon de Indigamanischen Verben, or the LIV. It is edited by Ricks, I believe. What it is, is a collection of all the verbs that have been found for Proto-Indo-European and the way they are formed. Uh, that requires a little bit of explanation. 
a Proto-Indo-European verb doesn't just have the endings attached to it. It can sometimes change before those endings are attached. Some of them you do just slap the ending on. Some of them you have to put an E or an O on the end. Other ones you have to put a ske or skyo on it. And some you put a ne or no on it. And if you run across a book like this, this uh, proto introduction of Proto-Indo-European here, and it just lists the verbs, it doesn't tell you how to form the present tense because it doesn't tell you how to actually form the stem. So, except for the imperative, which is this the bare stem, you really can't do much without this book, without the LIV. It's in German. Okay, fine. But that's not such a big deal because it'll list the root and then next to it it'll list the meaning in German and the meaning in German is one, two words maybe. And so it, it doesn't take very much trouble to look it up in a German English dictionary. And it also has different stems for different tenses and moods, like the desiderative, which is to desire something. Um, and it's pretty easy to under once you know what a desiderative is, to know what that desiderative without a V is the same as desiderative with the E on the end. So you can use this book with just a German English dictionary and get quite a lot out of it. It's probably fairly expensive and difficult to find, but it's worth finding one at a, um, at a library, college or university library, and then you can take the notes from that. But you will need this if you're going to be writing anything in Proto-Indo-European. The final book I want to show is the Encyclopedia of Indo-European Culture by Mallory Adams, the same one who wrote the Oxford Introduction. You can see it's a rather large book. It's, as it says, on Indo-European culture, so it's not just on the language, it's also on, on the culture. It's, there are archaeological cultures related to it. There are sections on the individual Indo-European languages. Uh, under a, a topic, a heading of sheep, for instance, it tells you the different Proto-Indo-European words connected with sheep. It gives you all of the words descended from it and their, their meanings, and it get, goes into a discussion of the economic and cultural meanings of sheep, which is why it's just such a, a big book. It's a wonderful book. The best part about it is its index, or its indices, are quite a different ways of looking things up in this book, which makes it fairly easy to use. It's very big, it's kind of expensive, and hard to find. Try to find it, again, at a college or university library, and look through it. You won't need the words so much if you have the Proto-Indo-European, the Oxford introduction to Proto-Indo-European, but sometimes it does say things about the nouns that you're not going to find in the Oxford introduction. For instance, it'll give the genitive form of a noun, which you need to know to form a lot of the cases, whereas the uh, Oxford introduction doesn't necessarily include that information. So it's worth finding a look, finding it to have a look at it, and especially looking through and seeing which ones have more information, like genitive forms and verb forms. It also has a section in there on the Proto-Indo-European language. That's a fairly good introduction to it. it. Includes some information on forming verb forms and the cases, and has a couple of stories that have been written in Proto-Indo-European. Uh, Schleicher's tale was one that was written very, very early and then it's been retranslated through the years to update it based on our, our knowledge of Proto-Indo-European. There's also an, another one uh, in there. Those are really good for syntax because it shows you in a story of how the sentences are put together both in themselves and in relation to other sentences. Most of these books here aren't going to tell you very much about what are called particles because that's only recently been shown to be important in Proto-Indo-European. By looking at the stories in this book, you'll be able to get a grasp on how those articles were used and what they were. So these six books together form a fairly good basis for learning Proto-Indo-European. You're also going to want to be, try to get hold of some journals 
some academic journals, particularly the Journal of Indo-European Studies and Indogamasha Forschungen. The Journal of Indo-European Studies includes articles on linguistics, and you may end up reading an entire article on something hideously boring and finding one or two words or one or two comments about the grammar, which turn out to be very useful. There are also articles on Indo-European culture. For instance, there might be one, on, well, I just read one recently on the sacrifice, which included both all the words connected with sacrifice and also cultural information on the sacrifice for the Indo-Europeans. So, you'll find this again at certain colleges. Indogermanischen Forschungen sounds kind of scary. It's a German title, of course, but most of the articles in it are actually in English. It's the latest information on Indo-European topics. So if you can find it and read through it, it's worth checking out the articles in it. I do like think I should warn you that linguists have their own way of writing. They have a lot of technical terms. You can find linguistic dictionaries on the web. In fact, on my own site, which I'll have a link to, there are there's a suggested link section which has a link to at least one linguistic dictionary. You might want to have that in, at hand when you are trying to read some of this information. It took me quite a few years to be able to figure out what the words linguists use to describe linguistics mean. There is one other source that is going to be necessary if you want to speak Proto-Indo-European. Proto-Indo-European in Proto-Indo-European, sounds could change depending on what the sound was that came after them. And unfortunately, when linguists write the Proto-Indo-European, they don't. They write it as if those changes didn't take place. They do that so you can see the root and then the endings without them being hidden by the changes in sounds. But that doesn't really help you very much if you're actually trying to pronounce these words. As an example, the word for eat uh, is head. You'll see it written H1ED and then a hyphen after it. And the, the, the little dash tells you that it, it needs endings to make any sense. The third person singular, he eats, form is to put a TI after it. So you'd think it would be head T. But there's a rule in Proto Indo European that a voiced consonant before a voiceless consonant loses its voicing. So a D would change to a T because of the T after it. So now you think, okay, it's head T. But then there's another rule saying that if you've got two T's in a row because you've added an ending, you put an S between them. So it becomes Hetzti. So you pronounce it Hetzti, but if you see it written down, you'll see it written down H1ED-TI. So you can see how it's important to know the rules of how the sounds change depending on the other sounds around them. I've included a link below to a site that explains all this. It explains in fairly technical terms, but I think you'll be able to figure it out with a little bit of, of work. It also includes a fair amount of lexicon and also some uh, information on various forms of morphology information as well, so it's useful for that. So these six books, that one website, are a good start. Uh, I wish you luck. It's a fascinating language, really no harder to learn than that, say, Latin, except, of course, that with Latin you have nice books on a subject. So I hope you enjoy studying the topic. If you have any questions about it, just leave a comment below or contact me either through my website or through PM. Thank you.